or the role that digital platforms can play in helping to limit global climate change to 1.5 C. And we're pleased to have a really extraordinary panel of experts to help us uh, think through and learn about these issues. So I'm gonna take a few minutes just to introduce them and to set a bit of context. And then we'll kick off with a few questions that I'll pose to the panelists and then uh, take your questions from, from, from the floor. So please uh, keep note of your questions and don't hesitate to uh, put questions into the chat as we go along. We'll be uh, reviewing those and try to get to as many of them as possible. So I'll start with the introduction of the panelists. Uh, Peter Browning, you raise your hand, Peter, so everyone will recognize you there on the screen. CEO of Browning Environmental Communications, the world's leading communications consultancy specializing in environmental issues. Uh, Peter's firm works with a very diverse set of clients from NGOs like our own uh, at R RMI, WWF, Carbon War Room, CDP, as well as industrial clients like Daiwu and Maersk in creating creative and credible communications campaigns. So Peter has a wide range of uh, experience in uh, in this space and in the in understanding kind of the evolving set of media tools and approaches to target audiences. Cassie Flynn is the strategic advisor on climate change to the United Nations Development Program, where she leads a, a 30 person team with within UNDP's global policy network. She's the creator of Mission 1.5, uh, an, an, an app that uses mobile gaming technology to educate people about climate options and to communicate those results to the relevant uh, policy makers and, and uh, decision makers in the corresponding jurisdictions where the participants are, are engaged. Uh, the results are, are analyzed with, in a partnership with Oxford University and it's really quite an extraordinary thing to have such a global approach reaching millions of people around the world in, I think, at least six different languages that I'm aware of. So Cassie will tell us a little bit more about how to build a global platform. And uh, Ingmar Rinshog, founder and CEO of We Can't Wait, a dedicated social media platform that is working to address climate change by providing feedback to leaders and companies on their climate related actions. Launched in 2017, We Can't Wait is a crowdfunded app that allows people to share ideas on climate action and provide feedback to leaders and companies on climate related policies and actions. So we have a combination of experts and, and practitioners and innovators in this panel. We're excited to, to extend this conversation and think together about what it means for the future. I wanna say just by way of context, I think this is an extraordinary moment for this conversation. Uh, first of all, I think we know from, from the rigorous studies that have been done by many leading institutions that limiting climate change to just 1.5 C will require both swift and extraordinary actions by a very wide range of actors, from citizens to governments, to corporations, to financiers. And we're not gonna get there by incremental or uh, linear change. So we're reaching for points in the system that are subject to disruptive or uh, that are tipping points, that are, that are the points where we might see uh, uh, extraordinary change. And that's one of the reasons that we turn to social media to think about it as a, as a powerful tool. Even this year with COVID-19 having put much of the global economy in in an induced coma for parts of the year, uh, we are likely only to see greenhouse gas emissions on the order of five to 7% for, for the year as a whole. And yet we know that we'll have to see emissions reductions at that pace on a sustained basis uh, to 2030 and beyond if we're really going to constrain uh, climate change to less than 1.5 C. So the challenge is a formidable one, but not an insurmountable one. In 2020, we have also seen a dose of climate reality that is, I think, having impacts around the world. It's the combination of fires and floods and hurricanes and uh, a preview of 
of what the, some of the worst consequences of disruptive climate change can look like. Uh, it's having an impact on people around the world that is direct and consequential. As one of the commentators here in the US said recently, Californians are thinking today about the summer of 2020, August 2020, as the hottest in the last 20 years, but it might be one of the coolest in the next 20 years. And that reality is beginning to dawn on, on people uh, and beginning to affect the foundation of, of how we think about the reality of climate change and climate action. So all this sets the stage for us to think about how we can use the world's most powerful communications and engagement tools uh, to inspire and activate climate action on the front lines. And that's where our uh, three panelists bring experience with those tools and some of the best practices and, and are at the learning edge of, uh, of uh, what we're seeing in, in, in the world. So I wanna start with you, Peter, partly because you have such a wide range and depth of experience across a lot of different approaches. And just ask if you'll say a few words about uh, what you, how you would characterize today's state of the art in using digital tools to inspire and activate uh, climate action, and maybe set a little context around uh, how did we get here and what have we learned so far? Peter? Well, thank you, James. Yeah, I think the context is very important because um, we have got a big shift in context with, with COVID. Um, and I also think that we were seeing, there was a survey out at the beginning of this week, which showed, I think it from Globescan, which showed that perhaps 90% of people worldwide believed in, in climate change. So I think that we have a very interesting context where there is an acceleration of, of, of the move towards digital. So digital platforms become more powerful. And then you have an awareness that there is a problem that needs solving. Um, so I think that, that that is very, very important. Um, in terms of what are um, the, the real success factors, I think, for uh, big campaigns, I think, and, and the state of the art, I think um, the key is really to be focused in your campaign efforts in a very traditional way. So I've been in this business for 20 years, and even in the days before I was able to, to work on environmental issues, a successful campaign was about awareness, it was about trust, it was about engagement. And I think that those tools, which are very effective at um, generating those things in audiences are, are what, you know, where the state of the art is. So I think in awareness, then social platforms are incredibly powerful. Um, there are amazing influencers who have got fantastic reach. I think um, on the engagement side, then people are getting very sophisticated at um, turning um, audience engagement into uh, new consumer behaviors, which shift towards low carbon pathways. Um, I think what's really different about the climate action space is, is the issue of trust. And there's a great big community of people who know a lot about climate action. And if you get things wrong, um, then you've got to make sure um, that then you can be in real trouble. And we, we see it all the time that brands haven't fully checked out with experts what they're saying and run into trouble. So I think those are the sort of success, fact, success factors of a, of, a, of a great digital campaign. Cassie. James, we, we, we lost you briefly there. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Great, I wanna to turn to Cassie and ask uh, because she's been on the front lines of innovation here for a little perspective on what, uh, on how Mission 1.5 came to be and what your experience with it is. It's obviously uh, from the perspective of, as I said before, of creating a campaign that has global reach, something of really, of, of it's an extraordinary exception and a, a great start. 
So congratulations on that. And what can you tell us about kind of how it's going and what you've learned so far? Thank you, James. And it's such a pleasure to, to be here and, and to be a part of, of this discussion. Um, and, and yes, we're, we're quite proud of, of Mission 1.5. Uh, Mission 1.5 really set out to help to connect it. And as Peter was saying, in, in the climate space, there, there's a vast amount of knowledge and a vast amount of um, expertise um, that, that is happening. And forgive the sirens, New York City is uh, alive and well <laughs> behind me. Um, the, uh, you know, the, but this idea that there's this moment now where people are looking around, they are seeing the impacts of climate change, they are scared, they are worried, and they want to be able to start talking about solutions. And Mission 1.5 really set out to say, okay, how can we have a meaningful conversation about solutions and bridge this community of people that are demanding action with world leaders that really have to make these decisions in a very quick amount of time? And so what Mission 1.5 set out to do was to use sort of gaming technology to make this bridge and to ask people, essentially in, in the course of a video game, to say, what would you do if you were the most powerful person in your country? What would you do to tackle climate change? And we are working with uh, some fantastic pollsters out of Oxford to, uh, to compile a lot of this information and make this available to world leaders as they are making these decisions. And the idea, sort of going back to this, this fantastic framework that, that Peter mentioned about awareness, trust, and engagement, is the idea is that we are using this gaming technology to be able to, to, build, a, to build better awareness, to have increased trust, and then also to give this engagement in a way that, that helps give a direct voice to people, to, to the world leaders. So we're, we're, in the, we're in the middle of it now. We've had some really, really good momentum, um, and we're aiming to have some, some good results by the end of the year, by the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. Great. Can you say a little bit about kind of the scale of response you've had so far and kind of what do you expect the trajectory to be for that, in, you know, in terms of reaching audiences in different parts of the world? Yeah, certainly. Um, and, you know, and, and when you're at the United Nations and you start talking about video games, I must admit, people kind of look at you with a, a raised eyebrow <laughs> and say, and say what? what? What's happening here? And so we, we really wanted to approach this from a really innovative perspective and, and from a let's try this. Let, let's try to be as sort of agile as we could um, in the context. Uh, with which the world is evolving. And, and when we first started thinking about Mission 1.5, certainly COVID was, was nowhere uh, in, in our thinking. And so we have had to, to adapt in, in real time. And so we first started testing um, in the UK. We, we put out a, a test of, of this initial game. And, and how it works is, is you can go to mission1.5.org um, that's word mission number one, word point number five dot org. And, um, and you can play a game and then you can vote. Or you can get it as an ad in other games. Because one thing that we really wanted to do was, you know, we, we all know about sort of putting up new websites and putting up new uh, sort of guidance notes or briefing notes. What we wanted to do was to try to reach a bigger audience. And with Mission 1.5, with the gaming industry, we started taking a look at, well, there's 2.7 billion gamers in the world. And it's not just people that are sort of what we think of as serious gamers that have lots of equipment and, and, and are, are serious in it, but it's also, you know, a, a lot of us that, you know, on our phones playing Angry Birds, playing Candy Crush, playing all of these other games that really access this huge audience. And so what we wanted to do was is put climate change and put Mission 1.5 to that audience. And so that we put it in as an ad um, within Angry Birds and um, within Candy, Candy Crush and some of these very popular games. We tested that in the UK and the results really, they really blew us away. Um, we, we, we reached really millions of people in um, just through this ad alone. 
And so what we're trying to do is, is to scale that up and to make that available in, in countries globally uh, so that everyone can have this voice on, on climate. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Well, um, Ingmar, you've been at the forefront as an innovator in this space, creating a dedicated platform uh, related to climate change. Tell us a little bit about what you've learned uh, so far from that process. And, uh, and I think this audience would be interested to know the lessons you're extracting that are generalizable that might, uh, that might tell us something about the, you know, how digital tools can be used to simulate climate action in general. Yes, thanks, uh, James. Uh, yes, uh, my, my organization name is We Don't Have Time, not We Can't Wait, but uh, the message is the same. We don't have time. To wait. Um, actually, I found that we don't have time because social media don't work uh, for the climate. Uh, most social media are either working against us uh, because they represent heavy economical interest or the algorithm is uh, not uh, is not care about the environment. The algorithm just needs attention about a lot of causes. Um, so it's a big problem with general social media today is that you only communicate to your own bubble. Uh, and regarding the one of the biggest platforms, Facebook, most environment organizations are not even allowed to communicate on a global scale anymore. They shut our organization down the day after we launched our own platform. It's kind of absurd. So Cassie uh, actually have, have, is on to the solution. Uh, we need to develop our own platforms in the climate field. We can't just use uh, the existing ones. Uh, we need to do our own platforms to reach out, uh, reach out bigger, not just communicate in our own bubble. Of course, we, we're have to use the big social media platform. But if we are going to reach out, we need to think, be creative and, and build our own platform. And We Don't Have Time is one of those platforms where our users could get together and communicate directly with leaders. Uh, so we are encouraging having individuals talking to business leaders, governments, politicians, etc. And our whole business model is actually that we work with companies and organizations that wants that feedback, that wants that dialogue to happen. We don't do ads. We don't force you to buy anything you don't want. We encourage the dialogue. Uh, and uh, I think uh, to answer your question, we need more platforms and we need to reach people uh, wherever they are digitally, uh, like this event. I mean, Corona has created a space of thousands of digital events for the climate where we suddenly could get out of our bubble because the physical events was kind of the old this the usual suspect in the audience now you can meet new people uh, so i think we're on to something here and it's only the beginning and if not the big social media platform uh, adapt uh, they will lose relevance uh, they i mean they can't be in the old world, they must change exponential into the climate field, or they will be replaced or irrelevant, is my opinion. Interesting. And so do you think that we'll see the evolution of, of many dedicated platforms and will they be, how, what, if you had to speculate on kind of how that ecosystem would evolve, will, how would you expect that they'll be organized by, by country or by what, what intersections of interests would make the, the basis for the, you know, for the platforms themselves? Um, yeah, I'm absolutely convinced that what we're going to see in the digital social media field is, is more platform rising, not just about the climate, about a lot of things. Uh, and I mean, if you go to the cable TV, you don't have free channels in the world. You have a lot of media, you have a lot of newspapers. Uh, it, it's, it's not really sound that we only have one platform to talk. Through. We, we need many platforms. Uh, so I think that is going to happen. And that is both a good thing, uh, but it's also a challenge because it will be even, even more problematic to get out of the noise. <laughs> uh, so, so I think what we're going to need and what we're going to develop is uh, ways of communicating cross platforms and 
not focusing on, on the platform, more focus on the network uh, where you connect and know people. Focus on how we human beings have, have created networks uh, before internet. Uh, I mean, we always have created network and uh, now I think we need to create the networks uh, no matter if they are on, on who, where you find the platforms. We're going to have different platforms for different means, but we were going to develop networks that is more cross over. And, and that is really beautiful that Cassie have created with the, with the Mission 1.5 that you had ads in other games and you have this cross platform where you reach 1.8 billion gamers. That's exactly how we need to do to get out there because the big platforms out there, they work against the climate. And I'm not just talking about the social media platform. I'm talking about the whole media. Uh, they're not covering this story. Uh, I mean, a little, but they're not covering the crisis. Uh, so if they don't do it, we must do it. Uh, and I think we will. Uh, and this has just get started and catalyzed through the Corona situation. Great. I think I want to come back to Peter uh, just, just for some reactions to what's just been said uh, before I go to the next question. Peter, you have any additional thoughts? Um, well, I think, it, I think it's very uh, exciting sort of vision of, of you know, multiple platforms serving you know, very um, specific publics. And I think you know, one of the parts of the conversation is how do you galvanize action and more effective and rapid action within the climate community? And creating new platforms to do that, I think, is absolutely essential. At the same time, I think where we are slightly more focused is on systems change and um, trying to engage consumers outside of our bubble and rather, creating, that rather than creating just more bubbles, which I understand is a totally necessary thing to do, um, we're very interested in finding ways to leverage those mainstream platforms and to get the message out through through those so as an example one of our our clients was arizona state university they created um an amazing documentary series called carbon cowboys shot by a brilliant filmmaker called peter bick originally from louisville kentucky and what it showed was farmers who were adopting regenerative farming practices who were often Republicans and didn't really think about climate change. And what they tell is the story of improvements in their lives, which aren't to do with climate, they're to do with, um, you know, dealing with drought and the return of vegetation to dried out areas. And we launched that on Fox News. Okay. Now, what happened then was an extraordinary conversation on social media where many, many Republican voters across America were jumping up and down saying, regenerative grazing is amazing. We've got to stop that. The Democrats are trying to stop us from doing this. And it may have been a crazy bubble that they were living in, but they were also living and breathing low carbon regenerative Greek grazing. And, um, so as much as I think it's important to create new platforms to uh, rally the troops, to speed up the discussion, I think it's also very important to leverage these very powerful mainstream media platforms to get stories out that respond to people's everyday needs, which, but which carry subliminal uh, messages of change, um, or even out, you know, outright messages of change that, that help this movement. Oh, thank you, Peter. That's really interesting. Uh, I want to kind of follow that up or extend it uh, by asking a question that has two parts to it. One is, uh, I think all of you have referenced this in one way or another. There are two sides to the climate story. There's a scary negative side and there's a positive solutions side. And, um, uh, communications in a way make some choices about which of those levers to engage and how to engage them. And I'm interested in your, your reflections on that based on experience so far. That's the A part. And the B part is, um, so there, there's a, there are communication strategies to raise awareness and activate, uh, you know, uh, consumers or, or agents one way or another. 
and there's a, a question about how about connection. How does that connection lead to the to the uh, to the influences or, or decision makers? And Cassie's program has a very has a very clear way of bringing answer to both those questions in a sense to which parts to focus on and then how to map that or connect that to decision makers. But I just want to invite any and all of you to reflect more generally on what we've learned about those two. Ingmar? Yes, a uh, very interesting field, I, I think. Um, I, my experience is that on our platform, uh, what we have created is for our users to give, uh, they could send climate love to someone that is doing something great, uh, to influence others to follow them, to encourage them to do more. Uh, but you can also send a climate warning to someone that deserves a warning, something they need to stop. And we have, a, we have also a climate idea that is more or less, uh, you should do this instead, like constructive. Uh, and when we launched this, we were really worried about that most people will give the warnings. Uh, and that will be a very negative if, if it's most warning. But in fact, IDs and climate love is about 75 to 80 percent of a user created content. So it's a great need for solutions and people need to be educated about that we have the solution, we just need to implement it. But I think we can't only frame the discussion about the solution without being honest about what is at stake. So I think it's something about 20% problem, 80% solution is good, but we need to talk about the problems for real. We can't avoid that discussion. I think that is my experience. Cassie? Yeah, if, if I can add, I, I couldn't agree more uh, uh, with Ingmar. I, I, I think that, you know, for Mission 1.5, what we've been trying to do is, is focus on solutions, but also urgency. And, and this conversation around urgency, I think, speaks to exactly what Ingmar was saying, was that people have to know the stakes and, and, and for so long, um, you know, we, we would talk about the stakes, but now people, I think, more so are seeing the stakes. And, and the wildfires in California are, are a good example of that. Um, the, some of the, the flooding uh, that's happening in Uganda. There, there, there's a lot that's going on in the world that people are looking around and starting to make the connection that, oh, we had heard that we would get more increased uh, and extreme storms. And now look, we, you know, we have these hurricanes that are, that are you know, battering our coastlines and, and costing billions in, in recovery. Um, and so I, I think that there's this way that, um, that we can talk about that urgency, but then also being able to sort of to keep it real when it comes to solutions, that, that we do know what we have to do. It's just that we haven't done it at the scale that we need to be doing it now. And, and I think being able to, to drive that point home and being able to help people to be fluent in solutions um, that, uh, and I was looking at one of the, uh, the, the participants in the, in the Q and A who, who, you know, that this idea that, you know, there's going to be one thing or we just have to do this one thing when it's actually a, a, a whole landscape of things that we have to do. A lot of different solutions have to come, come into place. And I think that we, um, we need to be sort of able to, to make that case in, in a clear way so that everybody knows what, what these things are according to where, where they live and what they can advocate for. Great, Peter, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, um, I think that, um, I think that um, the, on the question of tone and positive and negative messaging, I think Ingmar's totally agree with Ingmar. You've got to have both. Um, I think if we look at the movement over many years, it seems to me we've been very strong on awareness and scary facts. And that's convinced part of the, of the public. But the reality is of the kind of systems wide change that Cassie's talking about, which we, we all learned, you know, so it was so beautifully presented on a digital platform called Project Drawdown. Um, it was brilliantly presented and we've known about it for years. But actually really, if we're talking about urgent action today, it's, it's really about activation and, um, the, and, and doing that is, is really difficult. I mean, I'm, very um, excited about 
in, in particular in the US, then we're starting to see very mainstream brands using their power to educate consumers about what is going on. Uh, there's a wonderful ad uh, by Burger King um, about its cow's menu, it's called, which is aimed squarely at children and is educating them about how the, the new feed for their cattle is reducing farting in cows, yeah, reducing methane emissions. Now, we all know that that's a big problem and probably the best solution is to switch to, to plant-based foods, okay? But really, if we're talking about urgent action, it's not just about dialogues with politicians. The private sector has to be engaged and supported to make the, the, this kind of scale of a change. And I think that Ingmar is also right that, that those platforms that don't have a climate message, that don't educate their consumers about what's required, that don't develop products and solutions that are cheap and accessible, um, then they will disappear. And, but we're already at that point. I think we can start focusing on that kind of activation. That's what digital platforms should be really focused on. You know, Peter, I saw that ad based on your recommendation. It's quite a remarkable thing and uh, tells a story about, um, for one thing, it's so clearly focused on its target audiences, which is children, young people. <laughs> and, uh, and it's for sure a signal of that that brand takes that messaging very seriously. So um, yeah, I just wanna broaden that and ask uh, if, if anyone else wants to jump in on this because it's certainly on our minds of how to harness the power of, of uh, corporate messaging and corporate brands and also keep it honest, which I think is you know, yeah. part of, of what we need to do. Any other comments on this? Uh I, I can say something. I totally agree with it that we, the most needed action now are to influence others to follow and do things. And uh, the organization that actually have, has this enormous power is global companies with billions of customers. Like IKEA, they have one billion customers to educate. Uh, we have MasterCard on an event I'm host of tomorrow. They have five billion customers. That's so enormous potential to educate people about the situation in the world and, and have them to understand it and, and do behavioral changes. Uh, so, so I think to influence others is super important and the one that have that power must use it. And, and, and we individuals that don't have that power, we must, we must demand that from the platforms that have the power. And my experience is that it doesn't take millions of people or thousands of people to have someone change. Uh, it could be enough with a couple of hundred people that are targeting uh, someone and, and ask them to do something. Not in like you're an idiot, but more like can't you do this because we would like you to do it. Um, so I think this is uh, very important. Yeah, and if, if I can add to that too, and I, I think as as consumers also being aware of the companies that we are buying from, that 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 you know, it, with IKEA, that IKEA is, you know, sustainability is so much a part of their value system. That and being able to support companies that that have that as an outward uh, part of their value system, I think helps us to also um sort of continue that that feedback loop of, of supporting these companies and essentially rewarding them for having this as a part of their uh, of their business um, and then ideally you know those are the companies that that are able to thrive and um, I also did want to say something I haven't seen the the Burger King ad I really really want to want to see this um, but I think it's also really interesting uh, Peter what you were saying about how it's aimed at children that um, you know, this the audience for that ad is kids, and and I think that there there's such an audience there, and as, as we are thinking about platforms and we're thinking about who's using these platforms, that you know, kids and teenagers and young people being so tuned into the climate uh, space and being able to help support that education and support that mobilization and that activism in a very meaningful way is something that I think we can all. Um, 
pay much closer attention to because it's grown over time. It, it didn't used to be this way. Um, and, and now it's, it's quite a powerful force in the world for this action. Yeah, thank you for those thoughts, Cassie. I want to encourage participants to please chat in questions that you have, and we'll turn to those. And while you're sending them in, I'm going to ask another question for the for the panel. Uh, this the conversation we've just been having about the role of corporate agents, I think, of course, has two sides to it. Uh, you know, a positive side and a dangerous side of uh, and. Um, you know there are there are, there's a, the, the corporate actors have certainly have influence to shape the conversation and to shape our understanding of, of what's what's real out there and uh, one of our European colleagues recently shared with us some perspectives uh, including a list of the of the most shared uh, bits of information on Facebook about climate in the last year or something of which a number of the of the top ten were outright misinformation, <laughs> and I'm interested in your thoughts about that, about the uh, about how to uh, push back or interact with the with misinformation that's so readily disseminated, you know, by the same tools that we're hoping to use for for positive. Effect. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, Peter uh, mentioned trust. Trust is super important. And um, this is not easy to say because uh, this will came with a price, but you can't trust Facebook. And uh, that's a real problem because if you can't trust the platform, you can't trust the information that you read there at all. So we, we must have Facebook change or get rid of Facebook. Uh, Facebook is a big showstopper regarding the climate. And not just Facebook, we also have YouTube. YouTube is distributing a massive amount of uh, flat earth society, f fake facts, uh, climate denialism, and I don't know what. Uh, and for instance, uh, my organization lost broadcast uh, with Cristiano Figueres uh, live was uh, cut out by, by YouTube. They just censored it. They, they cut our stream. Uh, and I can understand that that could happen by mistake or anything, but they don't even answer when we try to reach them and ask them, why did you cut out a climate stream about the situation in the world? They don't answer. Uh, I mean, we can't have that global platforms that totally ignores their users and the world. Uh, we need to have other infrastructure. And if they don't do it, we miss, must replace them. I mean, they haven't existed for more than 20 years. So, so let's build something better. Let's build something greener, something uh, more human. And um, that's important, but we have them. So we must use them because to reach people and, and Peter is absolutely right. We, we need to use what we have now. We can't build a new society. We don't have time for that. We must use the society that we have. And we need to preserve the ones in power and the businesses and organizations to change. Peter, anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously the, the social media platforms which have revolutionized our lives and destroyed, um, you know, also had a, a, a malign effect on my old industry, the traditional media, which I think is very significant in this discussion. Um, and I think that they will be regulated. Um, but you know, remember the Arab Spring. If you have friends in places like Russia, um, Facebook is an absolute lifeline, okay? So it may be having deleterious effects in Western democracies, but it has had a, a very powerful, powerful effects in other countries. But I do think it will be regulated and the capacity to use it for global campaigns for borderless cheap communications may be reduced over time. So I think uh, I echo Ingmar also, let's use it um, and use it to our advantage. On the question of um, disinformation, it's really shocking the stats that are coming out about, you know, counterfactual information being sick, you know,
shared six times more often than actual factual information. And I think that the, you know, one of the key things about using, leveraging these social platforms is, is to, you know, create content that is relatable and um, emotional. Um, and this tradition of our movement to put out endless facts is not going to deliver the goods, I'm afraid. So we need to change that approach to, to messaging. Yeah. Yeah, and I think too that there's something here as well about, um, we, back to this word trust, and I think also talking about trust when it comes to science. Um, you know, there, there is a war on science now and 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 there is a war i mean i still I, I remember when you know ipcc reports would come out and it was the discussion point was the content of those of those reports not whether those reports were valid or not and 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 i think that there there's been this evolution that um is very apparent and i think certainly we see this you know with facebook and other and other platforms i mean because they're essentially an algorithm i mean they're pushing out content that people react to, and and with that, it, it you know we start to see this war on science really take take place, and and you know and Ingmar, I was watching. Uh, we don't have time when Christiana um, was was all of a sudden it went blank, and you know Christiana, who has been a tireless advocate uh, for for climate change and 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 an incredible one, um, to see that for whatever reason to to have it go out at that moment was. Um, was 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 really destabilizing because you know it, these conversations we need to be able to to have this sort of um this element of trust this element of of um uh, sort of faith in the experts and the expertise that that exists out there um in a way that that we can continually reinforce um with mission 1.5 you know we we feature sort of six major categories of climate solutions. So, you know, energy, transport, nature, farms and food, green economy, and protecting people. And talking about what fit in those buckets took us months and months of time. And it was entirely dependent on IPCC, Project Drawdown, a number of academic institutions that, um, that we had known had been doing this research for, for a very long time. And even then, um, you know, when we launched it, it, it was, you know, we were like, we are rock solid here. And even then people would say to us, well, well, wait a minute, what, you know, wh why are you talking about, um, you know, a, a plant-based diet? Or, or why are you talking about um, uh, cleaner fueled planes? And, and this was something that it, it's because this, this science is being questioned in a way that um, I think we really have to, have to start to be thinking about. I want to turn to one of the questions from the participants, which says, what is the most surprising climate behavior on behalf of consumers that the panelists' digital platforms have exposed? Useful behaviors that can be scaled as well as antagonistic behaviors. Any good examples? Uh. You mean behavior in the digital space? Yes. Like, well, like I think the question is going toward, uh, you know, ultimately we're looking for, uh, for behaviors that affect emissions. Uh, so m maybe both, uh, you know, certainly uh, I, I think digital space may okay. entrain others and then- I, I would say Friday the future. Uh, that's the perfect example. You have those uh, kids, I mean, it's not many people in every city, but with the help of social media, they connect with each other and it will suddenly be this critical mass movement of millions of young people all around the world that are connected. But uh, I mean, most of the manifestation are small groups of children, like 10, 20, 40 people, but they connect on the internet and cooperate and scale. So, so I think that is something uh, many organizations, many activists and, and many uh, actors could, could do the same. We don't need to be many people at one place at the same time. 
but we could be many people on many places. We could few people on many places and many people on the world doing the same stuff. Uh, and that is a really powerful thing. So conclude, use the digital platform and the physical world in, in, yeah. together. That's a good activist. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's, I, I actually, when I was, I was a journalist uh, yonks ago and um, uh, in Paris, I remember reporting on a school strike about the privatization of the university education system and um, found it was actually the, the son of a, a, a British journalist who was organizing this school strike. But it's amazing what social media has done there with Fridays for Future, you know, encouraging people all the, over the world. The UK has never been much into strikes, but to get kids school, striking, it's unbelievable what's yeah, happening. Sweden, so Sweden took another strike. So, incredible, yeah. inc it demonstrates incredible power of the combination of, of authentic, uh, brilliant people saying something new and fresh and, and using the power of the internet to communicate. So I think that's a very good example. But I do also think that, um, I do think that one of the areas which I think is really important, again, going back to, um, rather than just being about rallying political forces, I think, you know, getting people to switch. I think um, one of my favorite companies is called Bulb. Um, I think it's only still in the UK, um, but it sells renewable ed electricity. And they've grown in a, a matter of, a couple of years to having millions of subscribers in the UK from a tiny office in in East London. And how did they do it? By making it really easy to switch using a digital platform. And it's not about convincing people to go and strike. It's not about convincing people to believe in climate change or to think that solar panels are better than wind farms or nuclear shouldn't be trusted. It's nothing to do with that. It's green is good. So if you like that, then join us. But the most important thing is the simplicity of the digital platform. So what you do is you photograph your electricity bill, you send it to Bulb, and then they quote you a cheaper price for your, your energy and make it green. And that is foolproof. And I think that's really what we, we talked about state of the art at the beginning of this conversation. And I feel like that's where things have got to move is like platforms that can pick up this interest in different topics and translate it into action online. Yeah, um, I agree. And that's uh, really, I mean, that's the business is going also. I mean, this, uh, the climate is going to be as much disruptive as the whole digitalization has been to, to the business industry. So if you combine the digitalization with the climate, bang, you have something exponential that's going to change so, so many things. So I totally agree. Yeah, no, I I, I'm struck by this, uh, I mean, as Peter says, school strike um, has a universality of messaging, right? I mean, it's a very, very simple message mm. that, you know, may not make sense to spend my time in school if my future is, is, is at stake in ways that are more immediate than, than investing in, in school. Uh, and so in the spirit of this conversation of searching for what those universal kind of thematic and very powerful approaches can be. This is what leaders have always done when Gandhi led the salt march in India, uh, you know, to, to lead uh, India's independence movement or, or the, the, the bus strike in Montgomery that Dr. King led. Uh, all of these touch something that has a universal and broadly based messaging. And I'm wondering, I want to start with Cassie on this because we're very much aligned at, you know, from an analytic and science perspective that mission 1.5, that making a point about the significance of limiting climate change to 1.5 is profoundly important for the future of, of the planet, of human and otherwise. And yet sometimes we ask ourselves, is the 1.5 message too wonky to be the basis for, you know, for a broadly based movement. So I know you've already made a decision on that, Cassie. Yeah. I'm interested in your thinking and experience and reflections, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, about it. We're, we're, on your, we're on your team here, but also wonder a little bit about how to message it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure Peter is laughing because I've, I've spoken uh, with, with, with Peter at length about, um, you know, Mission 1.5. Is it an opportunity to educate people about the importance of 1.5? That, that this, that the number 1.5 essentially represents the threshold. And is this something that people need to know about? Or, as you said, James, it, is it too wonky? Is it too in the weeds? And um, is it a matter of, you know, kind of to also using, using what Peter was just saying, green is good. And then we just, we just take it from there. Um, and, and so it is a bit of an experiment for us. And, and what we have done with Mission 1.5 actually is really try to reinforce the 1.5. And so actually when you play the game, there's a thermometer and the choices that you make, either you make the thermometer go up or down and then you get judged at the game as if you have, have if you kept temperature below 1.5 degrees, you win. Um, if it goes above, uh, you lose. And um, and just keeping it very very simple in in that way. And um, and actually, one of the things that I I think the ways that we've also had to pivot because of COVID is is because of so many more people staying home to learn um, and parents having to teach their kids that we started getting a lot of requests from parents and teachers saying, we've played this game, but we don't understand why was this a thousand points and why was this 500 points and what is 1.5, you know, and, and so what we actually did was now, and we're about to launch it, is we created a whole learning module that is associated with every single question within Mission 1.5. So when you get asked a question about, um, about protecting nature, and you start to look at, well, what does it mean to protect a forest? What does it mean to protect the ocean? That now we've, we have an accompanying learning module that talks about each of those pieces in, in depth. Um, and so we'll certainly keep you posted on, on this. And we do think it's worth people being very fluent in these solutions and, and being able to, to go beyond the calls for, we want something to happen, do something, do something, do something that instead being able to say, and here's how we are envisioning our future, and here's what we are thinking about it. And 1.5 is, is a key part of that. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll keep you posted on, on, how, this, on how this goes, uh, because it is, it is an experiment. It, it is, it's a teaching moment. No, we're certainly hopeful that you're successful with it because it does create a, a kind of ground of truth uh, or context or, you know, playing field to make, uh, to assess what's significant or less significant. If we come back to the Burger King example, is 30% reduction in methane emissions from cows good enough, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's good, uh, but at some level we do need to be saying, are we on track? And having a very serious conversation uh, among all the stakeholders around, around that question of, kind of 1.5 C. So I see another question is just coming in on this. How can 1.5 C climate actors better collaborate and, uh, and raise an increasingly noisy digital uh, narrative on climate change? There's definitely, um, uh, you know, uh, a set of powerful actors from United Nations to Greenpeace to uh, the raft of NGOs who are working independently and probably not as coordinated as we can be. So some of you might have thoughts on how we can better collaborate. Um, I think that one of the wonderful things about the environmental movement in combination with digital has been how much collaboration there has been. And Fridays for Future is a great example of that. Um, I think that when you think about the, the different NGOs, one of our best experiences of this was uh, on the topic of land use emissions. So uh, we, my, my group recognized that there was a problem with the land uh, emissions discussion um, at the UN climate talks. And so we brought together, um, supported by the Nature Conservancy, a group of actors, UN actors and NGOs and researched messaging which enabled a, a more um, concerted effort which supported everybody's 
interests and also crossed over to different um, countries and, and, and reached different groups. So I think that um, multi-stakeholder initiatives where you gather a group of NGOs and you find common ground, um, it's painstaking, it's really, really hard work, but it can be very effective. Uh, the icing on the cake of that campaign, incidentally, was, um, was, was a, a video produced by Greta, so, so the, um, and, and George Monbiot, the journalist from the UK, um, about natural climate solutions, which was seen you know, hundreds of millions of times and really galvanized the movement around nature-based solutions. So I think it, it, it can be done, and I think it's important work, but it's time-consuming and, um, and, and needs good levels of funding. Ingmar? I'm, I'm not sure I agree to 100% about that the climate movement needs to coordinate everything uh, because we also, I mean, we need, to, we, need to, we need to coordinate about the problem that we need to solve this. But as we all know in this conversation, there's a lot of solutions out there and it's hard even for experts to know exactly what solution we should implement. And I think, it, I think we could join more people if the climate movement could be more, more openless. Some mm. people advocate nuclear, some people advocate only renewables, some people advocate uh, natural solutions, some people advocate some crazy other solution, I don't know. But I think by opening up the climate space and, and have a much higher tolerance for different opinions about how to solve it, I think we could move forward and actually join more people. So we absolutely, we need to collaborate about working against the enemy. I mean, the fossil fuel interest, that's a common enemy. But I also think that we need to have tolerance for different views because we need people voting for the Republicans. We need people voting for the Democrats. We need everyone to, to actually have an opinion about to solve this situation we are in. Uh, so, so I think we should not, we should not, we should collaborate about working, but, but we should tolerate many different views in that collaboration. And, and I think we're, we're going there, uh, but I think we could go there a little bit faster, actually. Yeah, if, if I can also come in on this, I think this is also a moment of, uh, you know, we, we also need really good storytelling. Yeah. We need storytelling about the impacts of climate change, about the solutions of climate change, about how this impacts things beyond sort of the, the, green, the green circle. Um, and, and talking about, you know, what does a cleaner, greener future mean for girls' education? Uh, what does it mean for human rights? Uh, you know, and, and being able to make these types of connections that I think also help us to be able to see this as, um, a, you know, a, a, as a way that we are charting our, our, our collective future. And, and I think that certainly, you know, as we've been paying a lot of attention to the stimulus packages that countries have started to pass uh, with, uh, with COVID and looking at, you know, with the stimulus package, you pick winners and losers. You do, and, and, and looking at the winners and the losers that have been picked in those stimulus packages, you know, in some cases, it's really alarming um, because you're seeing an acceleration of fossil fuels. Um, in other cases, you are seeing an acceleration of renewable energy. And, and those are just two examples of the many ways that these stimulus packages are, are evolving. And so I think also being able to say, okay, well, what, what can we rally behind? How do, you know, kind of quoting Peter here, how do we keep it simple? Um, and and make sure that we are all moving in um, in in the in the same direction. Well, we're just about to the top of the hour. I want to ask. Uh, this has been kind of a dark year, <laughs> I think it's fair to say, uh, between COVID and climate events and uh, challenges around the world. Uh, I just want to ask each of you, uh, what's the brightest spot you've seen uh, in recent months? as you think about kind of the path forward, uh, what's, what's given you encouragement? I can go first. Um, I've seen a lot of things actually this week with climate week, uh, a lot of, a lot of news from businesses 
that is doing uh, climate action. And, and I see in, and also talk to many business leaders that talk about the climate as a climate activist. <laughs> Uh, so the business community are slowly awakening and more and more uh, people are getting real action out of it. But, so that's very positive. But, but I mean, we need so many more. So we need to scale that. Uh, but there is a positive core going on. And, and actually, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that if, if we're going to see another president in the US, uh, I think that's going to release so much... Uh, change uh, so that could be like uh, turning things around for real uh, because things are building up uh, but we need to go over the uh, over the tap so we explode in this action but i see more and more action uh, and usually I, I try i i work really hard to find good news about the climate and it's really easy to find the bad news but but Nowadays, I got flooded by good news. I can't ca catch up, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Lots happening, yeah. But it's not enough, of course, as you know. Peter? Uh, for me, it's uh, definitely the announcement yesterday that, that China aims to be carbon neutral by 2060. I, 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 that kind of caught me by, and I think a lot of people, by surprise. And um, it, it's an incredible signal, especially after the EU... Um, proposal to um, increase their ambition on emissions reduction. Yeah, terrific. Cassie. Yeah, and 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 I agree with with both uh, both of both of those. Um, and I think another thing too that that we are seeing, and and certainly as as at the UN as we're looking at what uh, recovery looks like when it comes to COVID, and what it looks like about building uh, building a greener future. I have been so struck by um, the level of young entrepreneurs that are starting green businesses. Um, it, is, it is really overwhelming. Um, we're, we're getting contacted all the time um, by young people who are saying, I want to start this green business. And, you know, in the context of COVID, you know, being an entrepreneur is the way to go. And, you know, and we, it has to be green. There's no question. Um, and, and so this is something that I, I'm finding a great deal of, of hope with that uh, that momentum is is growing and uh, and we're starting starting to see this happen in a, in a really fantastic way. Well, I'll add my own from the wonky side. Uh, we've seen just in the last two weeks major studies from the International Energy Agency, from DNVGL, a consultancy, and from BP. Uh, all that point to possible pathways to 1.5 C. And these are, the, these are the mainstream analysts who are starting to come toward uh, seeing the tipping points that are possible to open the doors to get us there. So um, there's a lot of interesting signals across the board. I think we're all excited about the possibility of, of dramatic change in the years to come and doubling down to make sure it happens. So I want to thank our panelists. This has been a fascinating conversation. And uh, I think there's no question that this domain of using digital tools in innovative ways is going to be a, a key part of the solution. So more power to you. And uh, let's stay in touch uh, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. Really interesting thank topic you. and uh, productive discussion. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you so much for hosting. It was fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, James. Bye. Bye. Bye.